Good to see all of you here. Glad you made it tonight. Wednesday night. Amen. Had a good day? Not seeing a whole lot. Yeah, seeing some nods over here. Good day. So-so back in it. Long or so-so. Okay, all right. Good, okay, all right. Well, let's sing this old song together. Tell it to Jesus, all right? Won't even make you stand if you'll sing. How about that? All right? Sound good? All right. Are you weary? Are you heavy hearted? Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. Are you grieving over joys departed? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. He is the friend that's well known. You know other such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. We'll wait on you there now. I know there's a dot in there. I look past the dot. I'm sorry, Sister Karen. All right, let's sing this second verse. Do the fears flow down your cheeks unbidden? Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. Have you sensed that to be sins are hidden? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. You've no other such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. Are you troubled at the thought of dying? Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. For Christ's coming kingdom are you sighing? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. You've no other such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Wonderful. I'm glad we can tell it to him, aren't you? He is a friend that's well known. I'm glad we can tell our problems, tell our needs, tell our concerns, tell him everything. He is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother, and he wants to know what we're going through. You say, he already knows, yeah, but he wants us to talk about it to him. And when we do, my, what a great, great comfort it is to us. Thank the Lord for another great day he's blessed us with and the opportunity to tell others about him. And we'll talk some more about that in a few moments. In this book of Daniel, we're studying on Wednesday nights. So let me remind you, of course, Sunday. Sunday school's at 10 o'clock, a regular worship service at 11. And then, of course, our Sunday evening worship service at 6. And, of course, our children's church on Sunday morning. And then our kids blast on Sunday night. Don't forget those things. And I hope you'll invite somebody to come and be with us. Vacation Bible School will be here before you know it in June. So don't forget that. And, of course, we've got a meeting coming up about that real soon as well. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, open them to the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel, chapter number 2. We're in the book of Daniel, chapter number 2 tonight. We started looking a couple of weeks ago in Daniel, the book of Daniel. We're looking with this thought in mind, dedicated to God in a decaying world. We realize this world around us uh, isn't... Uh, guess getting any better for the children of God is decaying around us. But I'm glad we can stay dedicated to God in the midst of this decaying world. We started looking at that first verse in Daniel chapter number 1 where the Bible shows us the setting for which this book is established when Daniel is taken away from his godly surroundings and uh, taken to a foreign field and put into an ungodly situation, and yet in a decaying world that he is in, around him, he is still seeing God working in the world around him. That was the first lesson we looked at, the first thought we saw in Daniel chapter 1 and verse number 1. Then, of course, last week we looked at when God's will isn't easy, 
And uh, we saw the challenge set before him with the king's meat and the wine which he drank. The, the challenge to conform, or I should say compromise, not just conform, but to compromise in the world around us. We're called upon sometimes as children of God to compromise our convictions, compromise what the word of God says that we are to be in this world in which you and I live. And, of course, God wants us to take a stand. God wants us to stand as his people. Sometimes that will require that we stand out in a world. And uh, when we stand for him, we will stand out in certain situations. That's what happened to Daniel and his friends last week, Daniel chapter 1, beginning with verse number 2 and through the end of that chapter. And, of course, God proved them worthy, and God proved them uh, outstanding for him when they put him first in their lives. In that three-year test, of course, in those first ten days, they were proven uh, ten times better. And then, of course, in the, in the three years, they were uh, highly ranked among all those that were brought into the land of Babylon. The Bible tells us there in that first chapter. Tonight, we're going to look at proclaiming hope in perilous times. You believe we're living in perilous times? Well, if you don't, you can go to uh, the book of Timothy, the book of First and Second Timothy, and read what Paul says as he's warning that young man in perilous times what to look for. And I believe you can lay that down beside your news when the news comes on, and you'll see a lot of those very things that are happening. You go to Matthew chapter 24, and you'll see what Jesus said concerning the signs of his coming. And you'll see a lot of those things happening in our daily news of what's happening. Perilous times, uh, literally means dangerous times. I was talking to a man just uh, last week, uh, probably a millionaire, and he said, well, I wouldn't want to bring no child into this world today. He said, i tell you, if I had it do over, I probably wouldn't even have any children. I said, really? And I sat there listening to him, godly man. I believe he's a godly man. And uh, he said, yeah, the future just don't look real good. Of course, he's looking prospectively, I guess, in the way and realm of uh, finances and uh, economics and those kind of things. He said, of course, you just have to really, really watch things. He said, I encourage my kids. And he said, it seems like they're not listening to me. And he said, I worry about them and what they're going to do in the future and what's going to happen to them. And, and uh, he said, I'm a little anxious about the future. You anxious about the future? I talk to a lot of people that are anxious, worried. Put the right word in there. Worried about the future. Now, I get concerned sometimes about what I see our leaders doing that I think is contrary to the word of God. We ought to be concerned about that. We ought to be voicing our thoughts and our convictions as God's people to them and warning them that they are going against what the word of God says when they do certain things. But I don't think we ought to be anxious, that is, worried about the future. How do you feel about it? You feel confident? You feel ex, uh, expedient? You feel anxious or fearful or uncertain? There's some things we're always going to be uncertain about. You don't know. I don't know. Don't know what the future holds. But maybe you're worried about something. Some people worry about their job. Some people worry about what's going to happen next month. Financial security. We all have times that we are concerned about things, retirement, other things. What will be there? What will be left for you? What will be this and what will be that? What's going to happen next week, next month? How will I make it? And uh, some people are worried about their marriage, their family, their health, the instability of the world. That's true for sure, isn't it? You look at the news, you watch the news too much, you'll shake. You'll shake every time the sun comes up. I've, I've been accused, and my wife will tell you, and uh, sometimes watch too much news. You ever do that? Hello? Am I here by myself? No, I'm not here by myself. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You watch too much news, you get worried about things. Third world countries get nuclear weapons and what's going to happen. And uh, a lot of people are overly concerned about some of those things. I think we need to voice our opinion and support our allies if we don't help them fight them over there, we'll end up fighting them over here. That's a proven fact. So we need to be uh, aware of that, voice our opinions, and stay in, uh, stay in constant uh, awareness of what's going on. 
But I know that God is in control. We have to remind ourselves of that most every day. Especially if you listen to the news. I think the great old spiritual is true. He's got the whole world in his hands. And he does. Y'all hadn't thought about that song in a long time, have you? I know you hadn't sung it in a while. I started to open up tonight with that old song. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got you and me, brother. He's got you and me, sister. He's got all the little children in his hands. Certainly he does. He has all these things. You believe that? Do you really, truly believe that with all your heart? You believe God's still in control? Now, we realize man's doing some awful things, but do you believe that? Will you believe that uh, later on this year? We're in election year. Will you still believe it? Oh, I'm telling you, he's still in control. He's got you and me. He's got all of us. Well, one of the greatest lessons we're going to see tonight in chapter number two is the great, powerful king of the world. And this day, Daniel's day, is going to learn that very lesson. He's going to learn that very lesson, that God's got everything under control. Hmm. Now, if he can learn that lesson, why can't you and I learn that lesson? Well, I say that to me. I look in the mirror and preach that to me almost every morning. I still have to be taught and learn those things. And, of course, the great lesson for this old heathen king was that, of course, God is still in control. One of the greatest, uh, I guess, the theme of chapter 2 is verse number 28. I didn't put it in the opening point of this PowerPoint, but it is verse number 28. And that is, there is a God in heaven. That's the key. That's the key to chapter 2. There is a God in heaven. And he's got everything under control. Everything. There is a God in heaven. Verse number 28 says. And he has everything under control. I'm going to read these first 16 verses. We'll end up looking at most of this chapter. We may not make it through this whole chapter tonight. Okay. The rest of y'all wants to. Brother Ricky's tired. He's had a long day. He understands what I'm saying. No, no, no. I'm kidding with you. Uh, I'm going to watch the time clock. I, I'm, I'm going to obey the Holy Spirit, but I've already looked at my notes and already prepared today and thought about it. There's so much in this image as well as we get to it, but there's so much before we get there uh, that God shows us in this picture concerning understanding God is in control. Uh, we can stand, if you want to, to look at these first 16 verses. Daniel chapter 2, verse number 1. The Bible says here in these verses, Daniel chapter 2 and verse number 1. And in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. Then the king commanded to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans. For to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king, and the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream. And my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Look at verse 4. Then spake the child ends to the king in Shavrach, O king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. The king answered and said to the child ends, The thing is gone from me. If ye will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, ye shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made a dunghill. But if you show the dream and the interpretation thereof, ye shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore... Show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. Verse 7. They answered again and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation of it. The king answered and said, I know of a certainty that ye will gain the time because ye see the thing is gone from me. But if ye will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree for you. For ye have prepared prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me. 
till the time be changed. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that ye can show me the interpretation thereof. Verse 10. The Chaldeans answered before the king and said, There's not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. Therefore, there is no king, lord, ruler, that asks such things at at any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. And it is a rare thing that the king requireth and that there is none that can show it before the king except the gods whose, whose dwelling is not with flesh. For this cause the king was angry, very furious, and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon, all of them. Verse 13. And the decree went forth, that the wise men should be slain. And they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. Oh my. Then Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, which was gone before to slay the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, Why is the decree so hasty from the king? Then Arioch made the thing known to Daniel. Look at verse 16. Then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he should give him time, that he should show the king the interpretation. You can be seated. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for the privilege to stand and proclaim your word. I want to thank you for this book of Daniel and what it shows us, even in these days in which we're living to be able to stand for you in this decaying world. Help us to learn these examples of Daniel and his friends and to realize, Lord, that you're still the same God. Help us now as we open this chapter, as we have it as chapter number two, this actual event that happened many years ago, what you showed your servant, show it to us and help us to be as wise and understanding and as faithful as they were. We'll praise you for all that you accomplish in Jesus' name. Amen. I want us to look tonight in Daniel chapter 2 and look at, of course, uh, tonight eternal things. Start off by looking at eternal things are troublesome to this world. Now, as you start in this chapter, there's some amazing things that happen that are not visible to you and I in the Bible as we read this passage of Scripture. It begins, of course, with King Nebuchadnezzar deeply troubled. I'll say some more about that in a few moments. But when you get down to verse number 4 of this chapter, the writing, the original writing of Daniel is changed. It's starting to be written in Aramaic and not in Hebrew. Aramaic was the common language of the Gentile uh, nation, of the Gentile empire. And Daniel starts writing this uh, book in Aramaic all the way over to chapter number 7 so that the Jews and the Gentiles could hear more about his work and what was going on in the lives of Daniel and his friends. It's amazing. Of course, uh, the Bible opens this chapter here, and it reminds us of what's going on with this, uh, this pagan king who does not know God, but he's going to reveal to him himself. God's going to reveal himself uh, to this king through his servants, Daniel. I, I'm glad God still wants to do that today. And he's instrumental in doing that through you and I as God's people. That's the reason God's left us here, so that we could uh, tell the world about a God in heaven. There is a God in heaven. Now, it's amazing how Daniel displays that. Daniel and his friends display that here in this chapter, uh, in this event that happened in their lives. And, of course, it reminds us to be careful in the events of our lives that we give the credit and the glory to God. In the things that we are involved in, the things God allows us to be involved in. I want you to notice the opening verses of this chapter that we read tonight and understand that eternal things are often troublesome to this world. They, they don't understand eternal things. You, you start trying to relate what's happening in our society, you start trying to relate the, the course and the plan that God has even in the midst of a sin-cursed world in a sin-cursed society and sin-cursed bodies, the world can't understand that. They don't understand that. They don't relate to that. As a matter of fact, that's the reason they come out with these questions. 
Why don't God do this? And why don't God do that? Why does God allow suffering? Why does God do this? Well, they don't understand the eternal value of things. They don't have the eternal perception of things. Now, Nebuchadnezzar here, the Bible tells us in the opening verses of this chapter, that he has had dreams, plural, more than one. And they have got to the point that they are troubling his spirit they're keeping him up at night. You have things that keep you up at night? I tell you, God rattles me some nights and uh, wakes me out of sleep and I can't go back to sleep. And then I know it's time for me and God to have a talk. And I know it's time that God's wanting me to see some things that I'm not seeing on a day-to-day -day basis. God's wanting to help me with something. This is a reoccurring dream, probably a nightmare that the king is having. He's not understanding it. He can't remember it, but he knows it's troubling to him. Something's happening in his life. It's disturbing him. And, of course, it's a message that God wants to relay to him, but he's not in touch with God. But God's got a purpose for doing it this way because he's got some people there that he can relay the message through. Now, he didn't know for sure about what all was going in, uh, but the future, of course, God is going to reveal to this pagan king. God's going to show him some things, some eternal things that's going to come forth out, right out of his dreams. You, you know, God wants us, you and I, to relate some eternal things to the world around us. And many times the troublesome things, watch this now, stay with me, the troublesome things that they're having is relating to eternal things in their life that they don't even realize. Think about that for a minute. Have you ever thought about the problem that somebody brings to you? You might be able to say to somebody, have you ever thought about that what you're having, the problem you're having may be that God's trying to get your attention or trying to speak to you concerning your eternal future? Your eternal destination. I was talking to a lady today. I was talking to a lady today. This very day, she has no idea what we're studying on Wednesday. Has no idea what my subject matter is tonight. Has no idea what what uh, what's in my notes or what I was preparing or nothing else. I'd already had this part of my uh, message down earlier uh, in the week. She had no idea, but she's talking about a troublesome person in her life, and she said, "I've been thinking about it. I've been praying for this person." She said. You know, they can't find out what's wrong with this person. And they've been running some tests. They just can't find out what's wrong. She said, I, I believe that person's under conviction. And uh, they don't even know it. And, and they're not looking at that aspect of it. But there's something troubling to them, causing them problems. I said, that could very well be it. You may have put your finger right on it right there. You may want to relate that to that family. And ask them, is God, God troubling them? You see it here in verse number two. He pays, he calls these high paid advisors. And that's who the child ends are. They were known for their uh, ability. Magicians, astrologers, sorcerers, and the child ends. Now the child ends were supposed to be the wisest of the wise. Now you got the magicians, you got the sorcerers, you got... Uh, the astrologers, but then you got the Chaldeans, and the Chaldeans are supposed to be the upper, upper, upper of the uppers in that class of being able to relate and understand and being able to figure out. Uh, they had ESP, not ESPN, they had ESP. I mean, they was able to figure out all these things. The Chaldeans, you know, they had all been able to interpret the king's dreams for a time. Now, they were confident in their job, and so the king's having a trouble here, and so he calls in these, all these uh, advisors that he has on payroll here, and the king has them in. He calls them all in. And he says, here's, the, here's what, what I got. I, I've been having this nightmare and, and this dream, and I want y'all to tell me what it is and, and what's the interpretation. Now imagine that for a minute. How would you like to have somebody to tell you that? Well, they have no clue, of course. He suspects these fellows are phonies anyway, to some degree. I think he's been suspecting that, so he tells them, I, I want to hear it. I want to hear what y'all got to say concerning my dream. They say, well, uh, well, we'll have to have some time. We, we don't have that supernatural ability. 
uh, to be able to do that, King. He said, uh, but we, we need to correlate this together. We, we'll need to get together and talk about this, all of us together. Look at verse 5 and 6. He talks about that very thing. And he says, uh, no, 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 wait a minute. Y'all get together. Y'all come up with some concoction together, and y'all all agree, and y'all make up some kind of lie, some type of interpretation thereof, he says there in verse number 6. And he says, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. He said, if you can't tell me what the dream is and you can't tell me what the interpretation is, I'm going to have all y'all cut to pieces. Hmm. Had a lot of patience, did he? I don't know how long he'd been dealing with these folks, but, man, that's pretty wild. And then he tells them on top of that, he said, I'm going to have all your houses destroyed, too. We're going to have them all cut up, too. That's pretty serious business. I mean, seriously, you stop thinking about it. You're talking about cruel and ruthless. And we're talking about the area of Iraq. We'll go ahead and throw that in there. That's where this king is at, the area of Iraq. Uh, ain't a whole lot changed all these years. Pretty still pretty cruel. Uh, a lot of things still happening in that area. So the advisors here in verses 7 through 9, they start arguing with the king. Now, wait a minute king this ain't right he, he let, let the king tell us tell his servants uh, what's going on here we'll, we'll give you some idea what's going on with your interpretation boy that really makes him mad that really gets him upset as a matter of fact he goes on and tells them there in verse number 10 he said they tell him said there's not a man alive they can do what you want us to do what, what, what have you lost it they don't tell him he's lost his mind but they say there's not a man upon the earth that can show the king's manner. Therefore, uh, there is no king, lord, ruler that asks such a thing of anybody. As magicians or astrologers are the child is. You're asking, you're asking way too much, king. It's a rare thing. They're saying, oh, it's difficult uh, that the king requires. They're putting it pretty mildly, but they're saying there's none that can show. Before the king except what? The gods. There's no mortal person. There's nobody in the flesh. No human being could tell you what you're asking us to do. They're trying to reason with him. And of course they're admitting it. They're admitting it. Nobody can reveal what you're asking us to do. Only God can do what you want us to do. Only God can do it. There's no person that can do it. It sounds convincing, but they don't convince the king. As a matter of fact, in verse number 12, he's very angry now. He's furious. He says, you just go on and carry out my decrees. As a matter of fact, you round up all the wise men. Now, that goes a little further. That's not the magicians, astrologers, and the Chaldeans only. That includes Daniel and all his friends. And all those Jews they brought in from Jerusalem. So that puts them in that category. That brings them in. And the Bible talks about it in verse number 16. Jump down to verse number 16. Daniel goes in. When they come to get Daniel to start bringing him to the king's palace to chop him up into pieces along with all these other guys, they're going to get them all in there together and cut them all up. Daniel inquires. He desires. And he says, what's going on? And when Ariok, the king's guard, tells him what's going on, he says, wait a minute, wait a minute, let me talk to the king. This ain't right. We didn't know anything about this. Let, let me go in and reason with the king. Can I have a moment with the king? So Ariok works it out. The Bible says there in verse number 16, and he goes in and gives him time. He goes in and talks to the king. He says, if you give me a little time, uh, king, just, just a few minutes, give me a little time, give me till tomorrow, I, I, I'll get you an answer. I'll get you an answer. And uh, the king agrees. Now look at verse 17. Daniel went back to his house and uh, to his buddies, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions. And the Bible talks about it here. He goes back once he gets that agreement with the king. He goes back. He knows exactly what he's going to do. You know what you're going to do when problems come? Do you know what to do when problems come? Do you know troubles happen to all of us? What's your response? What's your first response? 
Now hold on a minute. We got we we got to come up with a plan here. Let's all have a meeting and let's figure out a plan here. What's your first response? I tell you what Daniel's was. He went back there and you know what he done? Watch this now. He called a old fashioned prayer meeting. Look at it right there. He called them boys together, made it known to his brethren, called them other boys together. In verse number 18, he said that we would desire, we come together that we would desire mercies of God, the God of heaven, concerning this secret. And Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men. Let, let, let's get together and pray about this. There ain't no sense in us perish. There ain't no sense in nobody perishing. No. Let's pray about it. Now, what would you do? You put to the test like that. Well, you know, we'd say, oh, no, we've we got to do something. What we're going to do? We'd get together and have a prayer meeting, wring our hands, and then we'd say, oh, man, I'm going to walk the floor all night over this situation. That ain't what Daniel does. He prayed with his buddies. Watch this now. Then he went to bed. How do you know that? Look at verse 19. Then the secret, then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. How'd he get the night vision if he wasn't asleep? He rested. He's confident that his God's still in control. And he began to bless God, the God of heaven. Now something happened there. He realizes there is a God in heaven. He can petition that God will hear and answer prayer. Isn't that amazing? I'm telling you, that's so amazing that you and I ought to be reminded every day of our lives that in problem situations of life, when we encounter a world, a world around us that uh, don't understand the things of God, you and I are made known to the eternal things. Now look at that. Eternal things are made known to you and I. We have a book that talks about eternal things. We have inside track information that God lets us in on concerning the future. He's made us promises that he ain't made nobody else in this world. His own people. We be, why, can I say it this way, not offend nobody, no English teachers here tonight. We be the children of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Huh? And he's made us some promises. Well, certainly he has. Now, the Bible says it here. Look at verse number 20. He says, Daniel's beginning to bless the Lord. Now, I want you to see this blessing because it's so important that you and I understand this. When he got this uh, revelation, he got this revealing of the, uh, the secret in the night vision. The Bible said, then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Look at verse 20. Daniel answered and said, blessed Read this with me. Read it carefully. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changeth the times and seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, whom has given me wisdom and might, and has made known unto me now what we desired of thee, for thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. It's a song, actually. He's praising God. He's singing praises unto God. He, he gets up, boy, praising God. It, it's a message of the, uh, the powerful God, the sovereign God, that God's got everything under control. He's got everything under control. He, he literally does. He's got everything under control. I, I think about that old song, the shoe as you sing. He's got everything under control, everything under control. Stars in the planets are in his hand. The winds and the rains at his command. You and I are part of his plan. He's got everything under control. And he rejoices in that. He's singing that very thing. He's got everything under control. Now, why, why should you and I rejoice with him? 
because you and I live in perilous times that a lost and dying world needs to hear that. You know somebody right now. Watch this now. Stay with me. Probably somebody's talked to you in the last week. Somebody's rung your bell in the last two weeks or somebody you'll run across in the next week that needs to hear you say, wow, that's a tough situation. But let me tell you, God still got everything under control. Our God, do you know our God? He still got everything under control. Will you, will you allow God to help you in this situation? Will you trust God in this situation? Will you turn this over to God? Will you allow God to show you something in this situation? How many times you and I say that to people? Oh, that. Well, they'll come to us with their problems, with their needs, with their concerns. How many times will you and I turn to them and say those very words? Will you allow God, will you allow me to pray with you and let's turn this over to the Lord and see what God wants to do in this situation? Oh my, ask them. Would you allow God, would you give this to God and let him show you something in this? I don't know. I've told people that. I don't know what the answer is in this situation. But i tell you who does. And I believe if we pray and ask God, he'll, he'll show you what to do. I believe that with all my heart. I've seen it. I've seen it too many times. Now, I've tried to give people wisdom sometime of what I thought from the Word of God. Have you thought about that? Oh, preacher, I have not thought. Man, I am so glad you I have not even thought about that. And, man, I'm telling you, they'd leave a, a little higher in their step. I said, whoa, wait a minute. Oh, I'm so thankful for that, preacher. No, 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 it wasn't me. And that's exactly what Daniel does here. Watch this now. Stay with me. But think about it. He's in control. And you and I need to share that truth in perilous days, you, perilous times. You and I are living in. You and I need to share that very truth with the lost and dying world and with those other saints that have, what? Uh, well, their, their, their faith wavered a little. Need to encourage them. And what? God's still in control. Will you turn it over? Turn it all over to God. Will you allow him to have it all? What are you hanging on to? What are you trusting in really? So he goes before Ariok, verse number 24. Daniel does. And in the middle of this verse, he says, don't destroy all the wise men of Babylon. Don't, 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 don't. Tell him, hold on, king. Don't destroy all that. Take me before the king. I'll tell the king the interpretation. Now, Ariok, he's a bureaucrat bureaucrat. You know what he does? He goes running into the king. I found you a man, king. I found somebody. Now, you know what we could do right there as children of God? I've seen it happen. I ain't going to go in there and tell a nut until you get that straightened out and I get the credit. Is it about that? No. No. We'll let other people perish. So I've seen other people. It ain't about that. It's about doing what's right. Always doing what's right. I had a discussion with a man uh, two or three days ago. I talked for over an hour with him and was talking about that very thing. He said, you know, it's amazing what churches do sometimes just because they want to get the credit instead of coming together and, and, and doing what's right. Everybody doing what's right. Demanding that everything be done right. Well, so he goes before Iraq. And he tells him, he said, I've got the answer. So he goes before the king. He tries to take credit for it there in verse number 25. I found a man, he says, he didn't find him. Daniel came to him and said, I've got the answer. So he goes before the king. He's ushered into the presence of the king. And he begins in verse number 27. Look at verse 27. He goes before the king and begins in verse number 27 with these eternal things that are made known. You and I have some answers from God's word that the world's never heard before. Some hope for them that they've never heard before. And look at it. He answers in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king had demanded could not, cannot the wise men, all the magicians, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers, show unto the king. Now look at verse 28. Boy, you all underline that in your Bible. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, what shall be in the latter days? Thy dream and the vision uh, of thy head upon 
thy bed are these. And he begins, he starts interpreting this dream to Nebuchadnezzar. Now what's he doing here? He's revealing the very fact that what? It's not him, it's the God in heaven. He's not taking credit. He's talking about the God in heaven. You and I are, have to be careful that we're not, to, we're not the people. We're the people of God. It's all about God. It's still God. And that's what he does here. He said, that, oh, I want to remind you, couldn't nobody else do this? They, they even told you, couldn't nobody else do this? But there is a God in heaven. And he reveals secrets. He reveals secrets concerning the future. He reveals secrets concerning this problem you've got. He's got the answer. That's the reason we, you and I confidently can say to a lost and dying world, Jesus is still the answer for the world today. Above him there's no other. He is the way. He is the way. And of course he goes on to say, as for thee, O king, thy thoughts came in the, in, into thy mind, upon thy bed, and he goes on to start telling him this dream. But as for me, look at verse 30. But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any, any uh, living. But for their, their sakes that shall make known the interpretation to the king. And that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. He said, it ain't me, king. This God in heaven is going to reveal it to you and show you something concerning the future. God's got the plan. God's got the plan for you. And we're going to stop here, and then next week we're going to pick up and look at this plan. But the next point I want to make, and we'll look at it deeply next week, is this. When God starts revealing things that we need to tell people, here it is. He's going to tell the king something that ain't real good. It ain't what the king wants to hear. Can I tell you that? Sometimes we're called upon to tell folks things that ain't easy to say. But it's the truth. Let me tell you where we mess up. I'm guilty. I'll go ahead and raise my hand. Well, I got to tell you the truth. Now, Sounds good, and I've often used those words. But you notice there in the PowerPoint, what does it say? Speak God's truth. It ain't my truth. It ain't your truth. It's God's truth. It's the eternal truth of God. That's going to stand when the world's on fire. I've got to tell you what God says. With love. Speak God's truth with love. In love. And that really shows how much you care. That really shows your heart when you do that. I, I, I don't like telling folks they're on their way to hell, but I have to. Let me tell you what God says about that. And I tell them what God says. Let me tell you what God says about this situation that you're living in. I'm not your judge. I really ain't. I ain't no different than you. I'm a sinner saved by grace. That's all. Let me tell you what God says. And he starts revealing this dream to this king. And in this dream, he's going to tell him some things that the king really don't want to hear. And hey, if he didn't do it the right way and didn't do it with the right heart, the king cut his head off. I don't want to hear that jump. But he didn't. He received his message. I want to tell you, you and I have to as well. Part of this prophecy is leading up to the latter days. These latter days will carry them all the way through to where we're living now. This interpretation of this dream. This great image that he shows before, uh, before this king. This great image he reveals to him about the future. The future events that are going to transpire from Daniel's day even to this very moment that are happening. God's going to show it to him. God's going to show him some things. God allows you and I to hold in our hands the truth concerning events that are taking place that is going to transpire even in the future. And have the boldness and the love enough to share them with the lost and dying world. God help us to. God help us to warn them of the truth. It's coming. 
in love, God's truth that's coming in love. Let's pray together. Now, Father, I want to thank you for the truth that we're seeing here in chapter number two. And I pray, Lord, you search our hearts right now. May you do the work in our hearts that only you can do. Remind us, Lord, even this moment of what we've talked about tonight. Men, women, boys, and girls, people that we encounter, Lord, that need hope in this day and age which we're living. Lord, there's so many that need hope, so many that think life is hopeless, think their situation is hopeless, think, Lord, that what they're experiencing is so, so, uh, uh, so desperate. They have no, no outlook for another day, some of them. No outlook for another week or don't have any prospects of things coming. But, Lord, I'm glad you put in your, your people the truth of your word that gives hope to a lost and dying world in these perilous days. Help us to proclaim it, even as you did, Daniel, to speak your truth in love, to tell them, Lord, you've got the plan. You've got a plan for them. It's eternal. That Lord will help them in whatever situation they're in. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our hearts and lives. Thank you for this time together. We praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.